when I was in training in medical school, I was taught the only people that have problem with gluten are people that are diagnosed with celiac disease. And if you rule out celiac disease, there is no business to be on a gluten-free diet. That was the paradigm. And then we realized that that was not the case. There are people that they react in a different way to gluten, still having symptoms, but do not fulfill the autoimmune criteria of a celiac disease. For example, you can have wheat allergy, uh, as we have food allergies or any other food stuff. Is it best then just to avoid gluten altogether? I would not think that that will be wise, you know, as in it's not wise to embrace any restriction diet. You know, if you open your mouth and you look at your teeth, it tells you that we're omnivores. So we're supposed to eat everything. Why we have a problem now, particularly if we embrace Western lifestyle, is because we don't eat proportionally and quantitatively what we were supposed to eat, evolutionarily speaking. Abdominal pain, stomach ache is a common denominator of these conditions. Changing bowel habits so that the gain and consistency of the stools would change. Bloating, so in other words, that sense of fullness, so to speak. It's something that, you know, you may experience no matter which one of these conditions you have. And then depending which part of the GI tract is affected, if more the upper part, you will have more nausea and vomiting, for example. And if you have, you know, the lower parts, you have more the cramps and the urgency to go to the bathroom that the brain communicated with the gut we have known for a long time. If you're stressed, you sovereignize with stomach ache, you know, <laughs> uh, or, you know, uh, again, uh, um, there, there are so many expressions like gut feelings, for example, that, that speaks by itself. But that the gut communicated with the brain is a relatively new notion. So if you take the microbiome on a obese mouse and you transfer it to a lean mouse, and let the lean mouse to eat the normal amount of food that we was eating before, that mouse would become obese, simply because it received the microbiome of an obese mouse. Hey there, welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew, you'll find me here every Monday and Thursday talking about three really important subjects that affect us all health, well-being and self-improvement. And joining me are many of the world's leading experts in those subjects. So if that is your thing, you're in the right place. If you're already familiar with the podcast and are enjoying the content, well, please show your support, like on whatever platform you're consuming in these episodes. And you can also subscribe. We've seen a huge increase in subscribers in recent weeks. Subscribers over on YouTube. So if you've not subscribed there, please do so. And it'll really be a vote of confidence in the work that I'm doing here. Remember, over 400 episodes to date, so I think something for everybody on every topic there. Now, in this episode, I talk to world-renowned gastroenterologist and gut expert, Dr. Alessio Fasano. We talk about the microbiome, whether you should be supplementing with probiotics or not. We hear about the relationship between obesity and your gut bacteria, I ask Dr. Fasano if we should be eating gluten, given so many people seem to have issues when they eat products containing gluten. Plus, we talk about autoimmune diseases and their treatment. And we hear why the huge increase in cesarean sections all across the world is having a negative impact on children's immune systems. This is a great conversation with a lot of tremendous observations by Dr. Fasano. I hope you enjoy Dr. Alessio Fasano, author of Gluten Freedom and Gut Feelings. It's great to have you on the podcast today. Now, starting off, this will be news to very many people, but the gut is actually meant to be in a chronic state of healthy, low-grade, localized inflammation. This is how the gut was designed. Why was it designed this way? And how do things like gluten, for example, which can't be digested by humans, how do things like gluten affect the levels of inflammation in our gut over and above that desired baseline level of inflammation? If you let me a parallel, the gut is a very complex, you know, um, network of interconnected systems. Um, it's like an athlete and needs to be trained to go to the Olympics. They are coming uh, now this summer in Paris. And training meaning is to face the enemies all the time and be ready to perform. Um, and when you are facing enemies, mainly do you face, you know, microorganisms that can be detrimental to us. And therefore, 
um, the training imply to unleash what we use to fight, you know, infections, i.e. inflammation. That is to create a very hostile environment for microorganisms to grow. It's too hot. Um, it, there are chemicals like cytokines that will kill you. Uh, there are cells like immune cells will leach you and, and so on and so forth. When you maintain a healthy, low-grade inflammation, as you said, you don't pay consequences, but all the advantage to be ready. So if the real enemy will come, you don't have to start from scratch, but you have that sense of, you know, readiness, so to speak, to unleash inflammation and to fight the enemy. Now, in this system that is, you know, from the, you know, evolution point of view, extremely old, because, you know, for two million years ago, when we started the journey as human beings, we faced pretty much as the only animal infections because, you know, life expectancy was 13, 40 years. So you either died of infections or you will not have the time to develop cardiovascular diseases or cancer or whatever. By mistake of evolution, Rudin got into this machinery, so to speak, because it's perceived by the immune system um, as an enemy, as a component of micro microbe, and as such, I will unleash the same kind of weaponry that we use. Um, to to fight, you know, this infection. Now, for the vast majority of us, that will be a low-grade controlled inflammation that will not translate in any clinical consequences, but there's a certain group of individual that belongs to the gluten, you know, spectrum of gluten-related disorders that actually the inflammation goes out of control. It's too exaggerated, and then you will develop symptoms. Is gluten a growing problem? Because it seems as a term to have entered the lexicon only about 20 or 30 years ago. Yes, it is. Um, and, and we're partially responsible for that. And that was the, the impetus to write Gluten Freedom to really distinguish platform fantasies. When I was in training in medical school, I was taught, listen, the only people that have problem with gluten are people that are diagnosed with CD disease. And if you're allowed CD disease, there is no business to be on a gluten-free diet. That was the paradigm. And then we realized that that was not the case. There are people that they react in a different way to gluten, still having symptoms, but do not fulfill the autoimmune criteria of a CD disease. For example, you can have wheat allergy, uh, as we have food allergies or any other food stuff. Uh, and, you know, there are people that, that will respond with a different branch of the immune system that is typical allergic reaction when exposed to gluten. And then there is this third component that we did not revisit until the recent past, I would say in the last 10 years, came back in our little screen of what we call non-severe gluten sensitivity or gluten sensitivity for short or wheat sensitivity, whatever you want to call it. There are people, they don't have an autoimmune response. They don't have an allergic response, but still they have an immune response at least to symptoms. And here where the gray area is, because while we have biomarkers to diagnose people with severe disease or with allergies, in other words, we have tests, for good sensitivity, we don't have validated tests yet. So there is a lot of discretionary, quote unquote, you know, um, uh, definition of the matter. But, you know, the most accepted being by exclusion criteria is that when you eat gluten containing grains, you got sick. When you eliminate that and you feel better, uh, celiac disease has been ruled out, wheat allergies been ruled out, then you're called gluten sensitive. And that is the growing number of people. They have a variety of symptoms. Probably the most frequent is chronic fatigue, IBS-like syndrome, um, symptoms, um, foggy mind. That they, they try to really look in several directions without getting an answer why they are sick, and then eventually they go on a gluten-free diet, they feel better. People who haven't read your book yet will ask, is it best then just to avoid gluten altogether? I would not think that that would be wise. You know, as in, it's not wise to embrace any restriction diet. You know, if you open your mouth and you look at your teeth, it tells you that we're omnivores. So we're supposed to eat everything. Why we have a problem now, particularly if we embrace Western lifestyle, is because we don't eat proportionally and quantitatively what we were supposed to eat, evolutionally speaking. You know, we were gather hunters for many, 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 many millennia. And meaning that, you know, we barely were living on fruits, vegetables, tubers, nuts, you know, uh, oil, oil, that kind of stuff. 
yes, meat, but rarely because you have to be a good hunter. And, and you know, why you pick stuff all day long? And meat comes very rarely. Same, you know, fish, you have to be a good fisherman and so on and so forth. And the quantity of food was, you know, kind of scarce, so to speak. And we were extremely physically active. Then agriculture came into the picture, put the gluten into the, you know, the syndicate. And this happened 10,000 years ago. And I don't want to demonize agriculture because that allows us to unleash our time that was mainly spent for food procurement. 90% of our time was food procurement to much more creative, you know, activities that build the Colosseum or the Eiffel Tower or whatever. And this was a done because we don't have to spend all the time for food procurement. But the mother gluten that we were used to eat and the way that this was managed was different than today. So that's the reason why we see a, an increase of gluten-related disorders as we see an increase in any chronic inflammatory disease if you embrace the Western lifestyle, including allergies, uh, cancer, autoimmunity, neurodegenerative disorders, and so on. Well, to complicate the matter further, we now have to contend with pesticides. Now, I know where you are at the moment in North America, the number of regulations in relation to insecticides and pesticides isn't quite what it is here in Europe. But recently, sadly, the European Union, the authorities here in Europe, uh, elected for a continuation of the use of uh, one of the the most infamous pesticides, uh, glyphosate, for another 10 years. What are your opinions in relation to pesticides, insecticides, uh, and they're complicating the factor as far as our, our gut health is concerned. Went in the wrong direction because, you know, again, uh, the, now we have, and I don't think that anybody would dispute that, issue of sustainability, respect of the environment. You know, um, you know, uh, in other words, a situation in which we do not depart too much from what Mother Nature put as a program in terms of, you know, um, to have a healthy diet that will keep us, you know, in tune with the programming of our, you know, biology, so to speak. We were not programmed to eat, you know, chemicals that come on crops. Now, why we do this is simply because there has been another two major shifts, so to speak, from the advent of agriculture. When we... 10,000 years ago, we moved from gutter hunters to settlers. Everybody was cultivating their own needs to eat. And then the second major revolution was urbanization. So people moving from the countryside into big, you know, city agglomerates. And these are consumers. They don't produce, they consume. So, you know, farmers, they have to produce for themselves and also for these other people there. And of course, when you have to do that, you have to make sure that your, your harvest is protected. And the way that they were doing was to use savvy farmer procedures. The case of that that led to the use of chemicals in an indiscriminate way is the globalization. When the production of food has been, you know, um, uh, concentrated in a few hands of multinational companies and, you know, losing 10% of their harvest on huge amount. It's a huge loss and they can't afford it and they can use anything that you can imagine. But that goes against quality and sustainability and respect of the environment because this glyphosate is fake. Not only we eat them, but the soil is going to be poisoned with that. And with that, you know, the ecosystem and the soil that is very important for our own health uh, because, you know, we not only eat the, the, the food that comes from the soil, but eventually, you know, we exchange ecosystem like the microbiome with the soil. And if it's sick, we will have a sick microbiome come in our body and that will create even more of a problem. So it's not just the direct offensive effect of chemicals that we ingest with food that can change our biology. It's also what we do to the environment. And, and in, the, in, in the time in which sustainability is such a buzzword, but, you know, again, um, we have to implement, you know, a sustainable, equitable, uh, you know, um, food chain that will be something that will, you know, be in tune with our increased needs in terms of increased population and so on and so forth. 
You're talking environmental factors there. We already spoke about inflammation. Now, whenever I was researching uh, this episode, I came across so many different conditions that affect the gut. You have everything from IBS, which you referenced already, to colitis, to diverticulitis, and uh, Crohn's, to celiac disease. And I'm interested to know, um, as I said, we mentioned inflammation already. Are there any other unifying symptoms that all of these gut conditions, these chronic conditions share? And is the environmental factor implicated in all of these conditions in some way? That healthy inflammation of the gut that you were mentioning is the product of the city state between, you know, inducing inflammation to train the immune system of the gut to defend us and breaks that you put, you know, on inflammation so that stays in that healthy, you know, range, so to speak. Anything that affects that balance can create the condition which, you know, the inflammation now takes over and goes from the low-grade health inflammation to a severe inflammation. And, you know, when that happens, you can develop any of the symptoms, uh, any of the conditions that you mentioned. Of course, when inflammation stays in the GI tract, that translating symptoms can be very common to, you know, um, all the conditions that you mentioned. For example, abdominal pain, stomach ache is a common denominator of these conditions. Uh, changing bowel habits, so that again, the consistency of the stools would change. Um, uh, the bloating, so in other words, that sense of fullness, so to speak. It's something that, you know, you may experience no matter which one of these conditions you have. And then depending which part of the GI tract is affected, if more the upper parts, you will have more nausea and vomiting, for example. And if you have, you know, the lower parts, you have more the cramps and the urgency to go to the bathroom, for example. So, uh, you know, th those are the kind of common symptoms if the inflammation stay within the gut. Unfortunately, because the gut is the largest and most complex port of entry or instigating inflammation, um, we learn that no matter which tissue organ is involved in inflammation, including the brain, for example, uh, will have the gut involved as the port of entry of the instigated inflammation that can spread anywhere in our body. It's interesting. I spoke with a neurologist a few months ago, uh, Dr. Ray Dorsey, who specializes in Parkinson's, and he said that he felt that uh, the gut was a port of entry for uh, people uh, acquiring Parkinson's disease through, as I mentioned already, insecticides and uh, pesticides. Would you ag agree with this? Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe the situation is a little bit more complex than that because you can have the pesticides who have a direct effect on neuroinflammation. But, you know, the most obvious consequence is as part of this gut-brain axis, there is a, a, a two-way communication between these two organs. That the brain communicated with the gut we've known for a long time. If you're stressed, you sobertize with stomachache, you know. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, uh, again, um, there, there are so many expressions like gut feelings, for example, that, that speaks by itself. But that the gut communicated with the brain is a relatively new notion. And, you know, not only the direct effect of chemicals, but also the change of the ecosystem of the gut with production of molecules that can affect then the function of the brain in terms of behavior or inflammation. It has been now object to tremendous amount of work. Again, the microbiome seems to be the bottleneck of all this because, you know, either they produce chemicals, the, the microbiome is instigated by these environmental factors or products that can instigate the neuroinflammation or can activate immune cells that can migrate from the gut into the brain and generate an inflammatory process, typical of Parkinson, Alzheimer, or neurobehavior like autism and so on and so forth. Well, you mentioned the microbiome there and you, you write about it at length uh, because you co-authored a book with Susan Flaherty called Gut Feelings. And uh, we have evolved to rely on, on this symbiotic relationship uh, between ourselves and these microbes. And this has, this has evolved over millions and millions of years. Can we explore that relationship and how much of the chronic gut conditions that we see today is because of, of that abusive relationship on our behalf. When we completed the Human Genome Project, that, by the way, was aimed to find the key of a solution for all the, the diseases of humankind, we were baffled by the rudimentary composition of our genome, only 27, 28,000 genes, you know, 
could not explain the complexity of human biology. If you think, for example, that worm that we go fishing with has 75,000 genes, that the plant they make you know, gluten, wheat, as under 50,000 genes. So we just got very rudimental. And then this was unconceivable to us because the paradigm at that point was one gene, one product, i.e. one product, one disease. And, you know, it, it, don't, it doesn't compute that, in that way. And then we learn over time, the beauty of modern nature, what is done by putting into the picture the microbiome. The microbiome is a second genome, if you wish, that has the capability of plasticity that we don't have with our genome. You know, uh, to, to change our genome, it takes generations, you know, with mutation that happen once in a while. And, you know, one of common denominator of winners and losers in terms of biology, it's always the same. Winners are the ones that are able to adapt very fast to the change of the environment. The losers are the ones that will be extinct because they will not be able to adapt to these changes. We will be losers if we have to base the adaptation just on our genome. And what Mother Nature decide to do? To invent this symbiotic relationship with our microbiome because it is now obvious that if I am genetically predisposed to Alzheimer, to go back to that example, that's not destiny that I will develop this. If I do, do not, depend how I play my genetic cards. This is the concept of epigenetics. So having a gene doesn't mean the necessary this gene is in function. It needs to be turned on, on off, together with many other genes to start that march from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. That would explain why some people, they have the genes for Alzheimer, for example, that would never develop it. And others that they do will develop, you know, maybe early than others because, you know, they play their genetic cards differently. That's the pathology. But the physiology of this relationship is indeed the capability to adapt because epigenetically, I can change the function of my genes and adapt to what is happening in the environment rather quickly. If I, you allow me another comparison, imagine the genome as a piano with 27,000 notes. If that's up to the piano player, what kind of tune you can play? You can change what infinite tunes. Uh, you can play jazz. You can play, you know, classic music. You can play pop music, depending who sits there. Now, if this is all true, it, the, what this implies is anything that disturbs that symbiotic relationship to choose the right time to play those kind of notes, i.e. to express or repress those genes, may have huge clinical consequences. Because rather than to adapt, that is the good thing, now you eventually unleash inflammation at the level that is pathologic and you create the condition to start that march from genetic disposition to clinical outcome. And all of the problems then that come with that. You mentioned the gut-brain axis already. I wanted to include that term in, in, in my next question in relation to obesity. It's at, at epidemic levels across the world. What's the relationship between the gut microbiome and obesity? Because I'm presuming it involves that gut-brain axis again. First of all, there are plethora of studies linking the microbiome to obesity. If you consider obesity as a metabolic disorder that, by the way, has an inflammatory component, uh, so there's also inflammation in obesity, you understand, you appreciate that the complexity of the matter goes way beyond the paradigm that we assume to be simply, I eat too much, I will be obese. That's, that's much more complex than that. And, you know, I'm pretty sure that you and anybody that will listen to this podcast will resonate on the fact that, you know, there are some people who said, I gain weight on just looking at food, not eating, because I eat almost nothing. And, and yet I, you know, my, my weight is on, you know, um, is not under control. And now the opposite, there are people, they eat a proportional amount of food and they don't gain weight. Uh, good for them. And, and again, um, so there is a metabolic component that the microbiome really play a role to the point that at least in animal models, if you take the microbiome on a obese mouse and you transfer it to a lean mouse and let the lean mouse to eat the normal amount of food that it was eating before, 
that mouse would become obese simply because it received the microbiome of an obese mouse. The metabolic conditions will change. And, you know, if you say, how, what is this? Again, it's extremely complex, but, you know, it goes back to the gut-brain axis because, you know, you change your behavior, changing the microbiome of the physiology of hunger. In other words, when you decide that it's time to eat and when you decide well, it's time to stop eating. And it's not a case that hunger is a, 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 an instinct that involves all five senses and, you know, involves neurotransmitters, involve the nervous system like the vagus, involve specific centers in the brain that command, you know, when it's time to eat or, or it's the society, you know, situation. Um, and, and the classical example is the Pavlov, famous Pavlov's, uh, you know, experiments on dogs, you know, conditional, you know, stuff. You see the, the, the ring of the bell and you start to secrete gastric juice if you've been trained that after the bell comes food. But to us humans, if we're not hungry at all, but we smell or see something that is very palatable, then we have this impulse that to say, okay, I really want to eat. And five minutes before, you didn't have, you know, uh, any 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 desire to do that. Just simply to, you know, a sense of one is you know, the vision and the other one is the smell that can start the process. And this starts from, you know, gut-brain access. And if you smell something, then the brain communicates to the gut, you need to start to secrete gastrin in the stomach, for example, because I know that in a few moments... I will start eating and therefore you need to prepare to be, you know, digesting food stuff. Talk to me about cesarean sections and how a huge increase in the number of cesarean sections across the world, but in some countries more than others, it's having a negative impact on the microbiome of uh, newly born infants. And that has negative ramifications for that child's health then going forward. So again, as part of the evolution we were supposed to be born by vaginal delivery for a reason. The engraftment of the microbiome now seems to occur even before birth. So mom lifestyle seems to be extremely important to start to transfer the proper microbiome that is compatible with the baby being compatible with the mother because genetically they are similar, not identical, but similar. So, but the bulk of the microbiome is transferred during the passage of the birth canal. That's where the vast majority of the microbes will transfer from mom to the baby. Those are microbes that mom has been selected because compatible with her genome, so to speak. When you do a C-section, there is no such a selection because it comes from the skin of the mother and then are not selected. If I am in the delivery room because I am the anesthesiologist, for example, this could be my microbiome of mom's skin and, or the, of the OBGYN person there or the people there out, you know, to do the C-section. And those are microbes that may not be compatible with the host. So it's intuitive that the kids will, you know, receive an unselected, you know, microbiome if born by C-section. Now, C-section has been a blessing, reducing the morbidity and mortality of mom and babies worthwhile. But when it's medically necessary. But when you do this because the OBGYN doctor needs to organize his or her vacation and therefore, you know, don't want to know when this baby will be born, or for social, you know, beliefs that is the best way to do it. For example, in Brazil, 90% of births are by C section, it cannot be for medical necessity, of course, because it's really an outlier. That is detrimental, very detrimental. Let's move to some solutions. You believe that autoimmune diseases can be treated. This includes uh, through uh, manipulating the microbiome. Can you talk to me about uh, the five pillars that include the microbiome and genes and environment, etc., there to help uh, treat autoimmune diseases? Of course, this is one of the most controversial paradigm that I mind because classical immunologists will stop you right there and say, you must be out of your mind. When you break tolerance, you cannot be, go back anymore. But we use silly disease as a paradigm that it's not true. First of all, let me, let me put a question to you. Let's say that indeed is true. What is the current vast majority 
point of view of immunologists that immune disease, when you break tolerance, will not be fixable, so to speak, cannot be treated. How would justify, if that's the case, the fact that a detrimental condition, because autoimmunity that doesn't give me any advantage, only disadvantage, you know, I'll turn on the inflammation and without being capable to turn it off, give me no advantage whatsoever. Evolutionary speaking, genes that produce disadvantageous situation will be not transmitted to the next generation because they have no chance, you know, either because these people, they die early or because there are so many comorbidities that they will die with conditions. And that happened with autoimmune diseases. Yet we see the opposite trend. They are increasing over time, particularly if you embrace a Western lifestyle, conditions like Crohn's disease, MS, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, all in a rampage. How do you explain that? If it's detrimental, it should go the other way around. And the answer comes from celiac disease as an example, okay? So the old paradigm, genes that I'm born with and environmental triggers are necessary sufficient to develop autoimmunity. How do we explain that some people, they are eating gluten, tolerated for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and then all of a sudden they lose tolerance and they develop celiac disease in the 50s. If there were best and sufficient, the, the autoimmune process should start when the two, they encounter each other, when you introduce baby food, so to speak. And celiac disease taught us this lesson. They are necessary, but not sufficient. There are at least another three elements there are play. One, the two elements are segregated by barriers. The most visible is the skin that we see all the time, but the, the most complex and larger interface is indeed the gut. So something needs to leak through. In this case, gluten, otherwise, you know, big model like this would not come in. So the gut needs to leak. So that was increased gut permeability. The fourth element is an immune system that becomes hyper belligerent. So in other words, that you create inflammation even when it's not needed. And that can be only detrimental in this case. And the fifth and not last element is indeed the microbiome. And the microbiome with the other two are highly interconnected. So if you change the microbiome, you're going dysbiosis, you increase gut permeability, and you also make the immune system to become hyperbelligerent because epigenetically you turn off on some genes that control inflammation. But even the increased permeability would do the opposite. So they are mutually, you know, influencing. So if you have a, a, a leaky gut, there are more junk that comes in our body, the immune system sees enemy, that's what is programmed to do, to fight, and you create inflammation. And, you know, increased permeability co-cause, you know, um, eventually dysbiosis. But what we learn from CD disease is that if I take any of the five elements out of the picture, I can stop out immunity. Of course, taking the genes out is theoretically possible, but we can't do gene editing also because we don't know all the genes involved that immunity. What we learn from CD disease being the only autoimmune disease for which we know the trigger, the, the, we don't know what makes people with, with diabetes or other arthritis. We know that it's gluten, the culprit, that induces the autoimmune process. What happened in celiac disease? You take gluten out of the diet and the autoimmune process shuts down. If everything goes by rules, the symptoms will be gone. The autoantibodies there, the anti-tissue transglutaminase, will go back to normal. The autoimmune insult of uh, the, the, the intestine where the villi are gone will be repaired. And you are not distinguishable for the other people that don't have autoimmune disease. So that autoimmune process can be reverted. If we can do this for CD disease, I believe that we can do this for any autoimmune disease. Of course, we cannot target the environment in this autoimmune disease because we don't know it, but we can target the gut permeability, for example, or the immune system as we do right now, because the only treatment that we have right now is to use immunosuppressant for MS or RA and so on and so forth. But I truly hope that we're going to focus on the microbiome model, manipulation to epigenetically turn off these genes and treat and seal the disease that way. For the audience listening and watching this today, what steps, basic steps, can they take in order to optimize their gut health by manipulating their microbiome through diet or, or whatever? There's only so much they can do about the environmental factors, but behaviorally, what can they do on an individual you know, level? There are many elements that influence the microbiome, some that we don't control. We 
mention, for example, the way that we're born or the number of antibiotics that we received as babies. That's done deal. We can't do too much about Or pollution. You know, I wish that we had control of pollution, but unfortunately, this comes to policies that, you know, I don't control. But one thing that I control in terms of my lifestyle is diet. Because, you know, I born once, I can take antibiotics three times a year, but I eat three, four times a day. And microbes, they eat whatever we eat. So of all the lifestyle that I believe has been negatively impacting the microbiome, and therefore our southern health, if we embrace a worse lifestyle, diet is the most impactful. And without go back and, and you know, to be, could be a caveman, because that would be unconceivable. But, you know, the common sense is, can we embrace a, a diet that is in tune with our evolution, something that's very close to gutter anders? And the answer is yes. So the diet should be a diet in season at mild zero, well, zero kilometers of locally produced in season, and needs to be proportionally based on the vast majority be fruits, vegetables, nuts, and tubers, and so on and so forth. Meat, yes, but you know, lean because at that time, you know, animals running around. There were lean animals, not the ones that have been pumped up with hormones to, you know, being grow very fast. Um, fish. Um, so in other words, I'm describing a Mediterranean diet. Actually, I would say a Mediterranean lifestyle because the diet out of the context of the lifestyle would not work. Because if you that way and you spend 15 hours on the couch, stay reassured the microbiome will not be healthy. But if you eat that way, with a small proportion, so that again, you know, not huge size, and you are physically active, both physically and mentally, I should say, um, you know, you really you play your genetic cards well enough to have longer and healthier life, so that longevity will be partially favored as an active element of the society, rather than to be somebody that crashes at fifty because he is not capable to, you know. Um, eventually to be physically and mentally independent. In gut feeling, you talk about prebiotics and probiotics. What is your thought on this as far as should they come directly from a food source, a naturally grown organic food source, or should we be supplementing with uh, probiotics and prebiotics that we buy in our supermarkets or our pharmacies or whatever? The firmer. It's easy and cheaper to eat in a way that you provide the proven food for the good microbes, i.e. Probi prebiotics, and use food that has natural probiotics in the right composition. So fermented food for prebiotics, I don't know, yogurts for probiotics, for whatever. Um, it's the, I have to eat anyhow. So if I eat well, I took the birds well. So sure, you can take supplements, or, you know, the, of prebiotics or probiotics. But this is this classic a shortcut that we in the Western Hemisphere, we deal with. We don't want to work toward the goal. We want something that is given to us pronto. Um, again, I'm not demonizing the use of prebiotics or postbiotics or, or symbiotics or probiotics that are on the market. You, you, you can afford it, you want it, that's fine, but not with the state of mind, okay, I predict this now, I can eat junk food or, you know, I have a lifestyle that is not, you know, conducive to be healthy lifestyle. Your cholesterol will go up and your blood pressure will go up anyhow if you eat junk. My final question for you is in relation to a recent study that you've been involved with and it's entitled An Integrated Approach for Prevention of Recurrence and Personalized Treatment of Major Depressive Disorder. Could you talk to me about this? Because I believe it involves the use of artificial intelligence. If I can give you my, again, very biased opinion of what is going to be the future of, you know, medicine, it's going to be, because it makes sense, it's a win-win for everybody. It's going to be personalized medicine and primary prevention. Personalized medicine, because we know that even if we have the same disease, we may have reached the final destination by different ways. And that implies they have to use different approaches to treat that. And primary prevention, because it's much cheaper to prevent than to treat, to not talk about quality of life for people that eventually are destined to develop cancer, they do not. Um, so, but this implies technologies that we did not have available until the recent past. 
capability to do this quote unquote multi omic analysis, to look at the microbiome, to look at my metabolic profile, to look at my genes, what kind of piano I have, in other words, uh, to look at lipidomics and so on and so forth. But this leads to a, 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 an astonishing large number of data that needs to be put together to make sense. And now, not only we have the technology to, to analyze our samples, uh, stool, urine, blood, whatever, to do this multiomics, but we have the AI approach, both software, hardware, to really crack these numbers and do modeling. So by using machine learning or neural network or even more sophisticated approaches, I can ask this machine, you know, say, can you give me the rules? Why? these people are sick while these other people are not. What really makes the difference when you analyze this multiomics so that you will find for me some targets of possible intervention? So biomarkers say, this is the reason why this individual went left and developed the problem. This one stays straight and did not. So that I can eventually, you know, try to really achieve my goal. So the future is going to be I don't know when, the following. You come to my office. I have in my database already your genome because it's been done at birth when you were born because, you know, the genome costs $400 so or of uh, 370 euros now to do it. No big deal. So it's there. And I ask you to bring me a sample of, sam of the stools and urine that I will put in the machine in my back of my office while I do physical exam and ask you the situation and so on and so forth. And then why this is going, your wearable device that I give to you has been telling me that the past week you've been walking less than usual or you've been more stressed than usual because your heartbeat went up more frequently than before. And we discuss all this. Tell me what the heck is going on. Why this is happening. How come that you're less active or more stressed? And once I have all this information, the analysis is completed. Now I have a wealth of, you know, data on your omics and a wealth of metadata about you, your behavior, your, your as a, 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 an individual, because again, this wearable device is putting this on my machine. And I put all this together and compare with millions of other people for which I have the same data. And the machine would tell me, you know what, material in the next 10 years has 70% chance to develop Alzheimer. Uh, and we got to make a change. Again, you can't manipulate the, 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 the genome, as I said, but you can manipulate the way that the genome works by epigenetic. And therefore, the system will say, you need to see it this way. You need to make sure that the microbiome profile will go from X to Y so that he will be protected against near inflammation. Uh, he needs to increase his physical activity um, or he needs to eat in a certain way and would we'll speed up the diet that I will give to you. So that's going to be the future. Well, you paint a very exciting, a fascinating picture of the future of medicine. That's quite extraordinary what lies ahead. But for the moment, let's leave it there. Dr. Alessio Fasano, author of Gluten Freedom and Gut Feelings. Really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. All I ask is for you to do one thing, maybe two, subscribe and share. Tell other people about this podcast. Until next time, stay happy. Mm -hmm.